Jeff, you say making a movie is like starting a new business. Why make that comparison? Making an independent movie. Um, there's so much to it. I mean, there's so many components to making a movie. Think of you're creating something um, from scratch, from an idea. So, and that's what a business is. You have an idea and you want to bring it to life and bring whatever it is, your product or service, to market. And you have to go through all those steps and components in order to do that. I mean, that's what making a movie is. Um, ultimately, you're going to develop it, produce it, mar and then market it. And so that's what a business is. It's creating like a product or a service and then putting it out to market and hoping that consumers consume it. And in the case of a movie, it's a consumption is watching it or buying it, you know, whatever in that case. Um, so how is that any different than any business? That's what all businesses do. They create from an idea, a product or service and put it out to market to be consumed. And that's why I relate it to a business. Now, in, in the studios, this, there's two types of, I, I believe that the studio business and the independent business are actually two separate businesses. The way a public company would be different than an entrepreneurial company. So let's deal with the public company. So a public company has shareholders and they have a responsibility and a mandate to earn revenue for, you know, and um, dividends or whatever for their shareholders. That's their mission. Their mission is to create wealth so that they can distribute it to their shareholders. Um, so everybody's focused on that, on wealth creation and, you know, and whatever it takes to be profitable. That's why corporations exist especially public corporations. In the case of a, so that's what a studio is. I mean, every studio is a public company. So every studio has to be financially successful for two reasons. One, if they're not, they can't exist and make the products they want to do. And two is their shareholders wouldn't support it. So the studios are public companies and they are financial institutions that create wealth. That's the way I look at them. They happen to be, the product they happen to be making is, you know, entertainment, movies, TV shows, whatever, um, but it's for the reason of generating profit. There's not many studio people I've met who will say to you, I want to do this because this is what I like and enjoy and it doesn't matter if we make profit. They won't last too long in the studio system. They have to be profit oriented. On the entrepreneurial side, which is what I would relate to the indie filmmaking business, um, you also, if you want to exist and continue, you, you do have to make a profit like any business, um, but you can take more risks, the stakes are not lower, and you're not, you're not accountable to anybody other than yourself and your investors. On, a, on the public company side, you're accountable to all your shareholders. Here, the accountability factor is less. So you don't wanna blow your brains out and lose all your investors' money or whoever it is. It might just be your own money and your own time. But you're, you have the ability to take more risks, which is what an entrepreneur does. Um, maybe have a little bit more fun, maybe go a little bit more passion, do the things that you truly want to do. Like when I speak to filmmakers, um, the two questions they always ask me is, what genre of film should I make that would be most saleable? And that's question number one. And I answer that question and I say, great question, but let me ask you a question before I answer your question. What genre of film do you like to make? See, in a studio, you'd never have that discussion. That would be, we need to make, here's what's trending, here's what's happening in the marketplace, here's what we're forecasting, this is where we're gonna make the most amount of money. In the entrepreneur, nobody says, hey, what do you think we should do? What would be the most fun? What would be like the most artistic? In the entrepreneurial world, you can have that conversation. Art actually matters. I mean, you know, listen, in the studio world, you have to make good product. It has to be fantastic and very artistic in order for people to be entertained by it. But they don't have the luxury of picking and choosing the way an entrepreneur does. Because they're, again, they're accountable to a smaller group of people. So, but on the business side, why I relate it to a business is because when you decide to make a movie from start to finish, um, if you want to be a, what I call a career filmmaker who makes just more than one movie, um, it would be helpful if you were profitable because that way, one, you'd have enough money, you'd make your money back, which would help to make your next movie. Two, that would evoke investor confidence. If you are dealing with investors, they would say, hey, this guy's you know, able to make money with the stuff we're investing in. So, so it does make it a lot easier if you're profitable on the entrepreneurial side. 
Um, but you don't have to necessarily be profitable because, I mean, it, it might not lead to a good career, um, but you could be what, you know, a hobby filmmaker or just an artist who says, I have a statement that I want to make to the world and I'm going to do it through a movie and it's important for me, this is, this is the kind of movie I want to make, this is the artistic integrity that I, and I don't really want to compromise, so I'm not really worried about what the audience thinks, I'm more worried about what I think. I personally don't think that makes for necessarily great business practice because it might not generate the profit that you're looking for. Um, but an entrepreneur gets to do that. That's part of being in business. And you know, if you look at the statistics of entrepreneurs, most small businesses fail miserably. Um, it's really, really tough to navigate opening a new business. That would be the same with indie films. Um, the good news about making any film is even though you didn't make any money and you could say it sort of failed financially, it didn't necessarily fail artistically. So you left, you're going to leave the world with your legacy and your message and whatever and hopefully audiences will enjoy it. Maybe they didn't pay for it but hopefully they'll enjoy it. So at least you get that out of it. Whereas a failed business on the entrepreneurial side, you know, let's say you open a restaurant or a clothing store or something like that and it fails, I mean, you're just left with a lot of debt and a lot of aggravation. Right. That's, that was actually, I was going to bring up the next thing is, is certain businesses, of course, and I was wondering if we could make that comparison to certain types of movies. So if you have a, a, a restaurant, which, what is it, 90% failure rate? I'm not sure if that, that's the right percentage. Yeah. But then versus, you say, someone selling widgets and it's, it's LED lights and it's all the rage. Uh, are certain movies in the category of the restaurant and certain movies are in the category of the widgets? Um, I would look at it a little differently um, because you know certain restaurants in certain locations I think have a better chance than other restaurants in other locations. So, so I would say certain the, the, it, there's a trend in the movie business. You know, as you know, like sometimes horror movies are the hot rage. Sometimes it's sci-fi. Um, I and there's. You definitely, if you're in it to make money, if you're in the film business to make money, you definitely have to consider what your audience wants to see and who your audience actually is. And that was the second question. Like I always said, they say, you know, what, what film should I make? And the second question is actually, how do I get it to the audience? So the first way to get a film to an audience is to identify who the audience is, which means you have to choose the genre of film that you are going to aim at your audience. So, for example, I tend to make family films. I like family films. I enjoy making them. I enjoy the genre. I have four kids. They were growing up. It was a nice thing for me to do. But I did it because I really enjoy family films. So, and then within family films, I'm very specific. My films are very specific. They're generally sports dramas based on true stories because I love that genre and it's very, very marketable. Especially each one has a, definitive, <laughs> a defined market. So like I've made two gymnastics films. So I can go to the gymnastics world and I'm able to actually target market gymnasts and dancers. Um, so I don't have to go generically across the whole gambit to try to market to everybody. I can specifically hone my marketing efforts in on you know gymnasts and dancers who I would think would be engaged by the movie for, by these particular movies, which has worked. Um, so as a business decision, it does help to, to identify the audience that you want to go to and then you know, choose the movie that hopefully will cater to that audience or vice versa. If you're going to choose a movie, make sure you identify how you're gonna, who the audience is and how you're going to market to them before you make the, the movie. Otherwise, you, it's hard to do it after the fact. You got to have, I mean, this is what studios do. I mean, I'm convinced, I've never worked at a studio, but I'm 100% convinced that if the marketing department doesn't greenlight the movie, then the production department's not making it. They need to know who it's going to, how it's going to get marketed, what the plan's going to be in order to monetize you know, the product they make. And indie film producers generally don't do that, but if they did do that, then it kind of like a restaurateur opening a restaurant. Like if you're going to open, say, um, an Indian restaurant in an Asian marketplace it could be it could be tricky I don't know maybe Asian people like Indian food um, but you better do your research and make sure they do otherwise your restaurant could be fantastic it just might be in the wrong place and that's the same with the film 
Like, you know, if you're going to make a film that caters to a certain audience and you haven't really identified who the audience is or how to get to them, you can make the greatest film of all time, but it's going to be hard to get at your audience. You know, and you had mentioned earlier, and I love this point that you're making um, about clothing, and it brings back uh, uh, something I watched about Diane von Furstenberg and her wrap dress, which was all the rage. I think it was late 70s, 80s. And then I think she got in trouble because she went and bought a new inventory and it was so popular, but taste had changed, if I remember correctly. So she had all this inventory that was not selling at the time. I think it made a resurgence later. But do audiences, that, that's the thing. If, if we know the rage is horror movies with a certain soundtrack and different things, mm -hmm. can the audience change and now you've got this, this excess surplus? I have a maybe a bit of a skewed opinion about that. So I believe that anything that is unique, good, and really entertaining will can actually create a trend itself and can find an audience. And you know, it's funny, I notice over the years, especially with studio pictures, that's always with studio movies, um, trends seem to develop. Like, you know, you know, in the 70s you had the Star Wars, Star Trek, all these star, you know, space themes, right? Like that doesn't just come out of nowhere. So I've always thought about like, how does a trend like that develop? Do people like audience members or you know, consumers write into studios and say, hey, we want to see star movies? Like they don't. Here's how I think it develops. I think that, that creative people develop these stories and then they go pitch them to studio execs. And um, you know, in the case of, again, I just read about Lucas and Star Wars, so I don't know for sure. I've never met Lucas, I've never interviewed him, but, but it's, you know, he, he says in his book that he went to everybody. He knocked on every single door many times and got rejected with Star Wars. Um, but every time, because I worked in big media companies, but every time a filmmaker walks out the door after they pitched a crazy unique concept, they leave and the, and the executives in the room say, yeah, it was crazy, but but what if like, you know, like at Warner Brothers, they say, what if Paramount takes it and we're wrong? Like, what about this? So you notice that like when one movie comes out, five movies come out. And I think it's because nobody wants to be wrong. So they have to cover themselves and make sure they have something else to offer. Um, because why all of a sudden do five star movies, the Star Wars movies or related type of stuff come out? Why all of a sudden is there a, a run on horror movies or run on Westerns? or romantic comedies or stuff like that. Like there's generally a run on them. And generally, you know, I mean, the movie business is driven by the studios and the big movies, the theatrical movies. And I think there's a run on them because every studio doesn't want to be wrong. So they have to hedge their bets to make sure that whoever greenlit whatever they did and they didn't greenlight it, they have something to cover. That's my theory. Okay, it's a conspiracy theory. That's what I believe to be true. Because it's just too random that everybody would be looking at the same stuff at the same time randomly. So I feel like that's how it happens. Now, there are genres that are evergreen. I personally think family is an evergreen genre. That's one of the reasons I work in it because as long as there's families, as long as there's kids that grow up and want to, you know, their parents want to view movies together, there needs to be family movies. So I believe that's evergreen. Um, most genres are evergreen, just some are trending more than others. But the way, the way that clothing trends and cars trend and that type of thing, I believe it's all based on marketing and I believe the studios sort of decide what the audiences are gonna see and when they're gonna see it. It's not the audiences who demand something. The studios say, we're gonna now move it into this genre. We're gonna release 10 horror films. We're gonna release 10 rom-coms or whatever. And that's what we're doing because, I'm not sure why, <laughs> that's what we're doing. And which makes a trend develop or die. It's a great point, like found footage. So Blair Witch, and it seemed like it, it, it tipped off other found footage films, and it became all the rage after a while. It did, but you know, in order for a trend to develop, it's not necessarily, only part of it is what people are making. It's primarily what is being released by studios. So there could be, you know, 10 of those kind of Blair Witch style movies. Um, the first one happened to be successful, so they might as well run a few more and see how that goes. But if, if the second and third are not successful, you can be sure that's going to die very quickly, as quickly as it started. So the trends really go with the profit. Like, 
they put them out, they see what happens, if it makes profit, then they go with more and more until they exhaust it, and then they have to come with something else. It's kind of like fashion, I think.